Yeah, and I also want to give a shout out to our online uh, audience here and also our Northwest campus. We're so excited that we get to worship together. Come on, let's give it up for our Northwest campus and our outdoor venue. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. So we're going to go ahead and continue our series, Dream to Destiny. And if you've been here the past couple of weeks, we've been diving into the, um, a couple of tests that Joseph has gone throughout his whole uh, life here. So the first week we 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 um we did the pride test. We took the pride test, and if you don't think you, if you think you don't have pride, you have pride. That is the pride right there coming out. But we went through the pride test. We went through the pit test, and then just this last week we um we we uh, went through the palace test on how God wants to propel you and really um, understand that the things you have, the things He's blessed us with, um, it's us for, uh, for us to steward and that God does want to prosper you. God does want to bless you, but it's up to us, uh, to, us to steward that in a, um, in a uh, well-mannered way. And today we're going to be entering something really, really cool, really awesome. I love Scripture. I love how the Bible doesn't shy away from anything. It doesn't shy away from any topic, any discussion that we may encounter here on earth. And we're going to talk about the purity test. Are you guys ready for the purity test? And how we go, we're going to dive into Joseph and how he uh, passed the purity test here. So our key verse here um, is found in Genesis chapter 39, verse 7. So if you want to open your Bibles to that, I'll give you a few moments to find the book of Genesis. Hint, it's the first Bible or the first book in the Bible. So we can go on from there. So join me in chapter 39, verses 7 through 12. We'll go ahead and pick up there. It says, and Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. And that's Joseph. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. She kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day. But he refused to sleep with her, and he kept out of her way as much as possible. One day, however, no one else was around. When he went to do his work, she came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come on, sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. Ran from the house. I don't know if this was a... A song, or if I just made it up kind of growing up here in, you know, here in Bible school, baby, here like, run, Joseph, run. No? Run, Joseph, run. Run, Joseph, run as fast as you can. Down the hallway. I'm making it up as we go. Down the hallway. I thought I'd just throw that in there. I'm going to be on the worship team next week. <laughs> but I'm going to go ahead and talk about some um, impurities in our life and not just talk about the impurities that can be found in our life and how it affects our life, but I'm going give to you, give you guys some, some parameters as well. I want to equip and empower you before you leave here at church today, because it's one thing we can talk about all the negative stuff, how impurity affects us, but I want to equip you and empower you so that you can leave better knowing how to fight impurities in our lives. And, and let's dig into the word today. Are you guys excited? Amen. So we're going to go ahead and jump on into the first impurity and how it affects our lives. So write this down. So impurity affects your family. Impurity affects your family. So when the Bible talks about sin, there's actually two types. Uh, two types. There's an inward motivation and an outward movement. So I'll give you the first word. The first word is transgression. That's one of the first words we're going to study a bit here. So that is the outward movement. The word transgress literally means in Hebrew to step over a boundary line. So that's to intentionally sin or to go over a parameter. Our English word would be trespass. When we step over the boundary line, that is trespassing. That's what the word transgress means. And you guys know what trespassing means. If you know if you do it, you're going to go ahead and get arrested by the policia because you're not supposed to be on land, <laughs> the land that was marked that said no trespassing, no, don't go any further than this sign. And that's where we get trespass from. And, and the Bible uses another word. It's called iniquity. And that is an inward bent, inward bent. An inward motivation towards sin. It's a premeditated, premeditated choice, and it's to continue sinning, sinning without repentance. So if we were to kind of give an example of here, so inic I'll give you an example. Inic iniquity is lust. It's this inward bent, this inward motivation. 
And if lust is in our heart, if the lust is iniquity, then that would mean transgression. That, then that would mean that adultery is transgression. It's that outward movement of sin. It's that outward sin. It's the action of sin. And I want to give that clear de- description, clear that fine, so that we know how when, when we say iniquity, when I say transgression, we get a better view. We get a better foundation of what it is. And Numbers 14, 18 says this, The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving in, 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 iniquity and transgression. But he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. See, impurity affects your family. Impurity can infect the third and fourth generation of your family, your legacy that you can leave behind. So in other words, if if the sin's in your heart, if you have this iniquity living in your heart, it's going to affect your family. It's the culture that the previous generation sets that will roll over to the next. So let me say it a different way. What one generation does in moderation, the next will do it in excess. What one generation does in moderation, the next generation will do in excess. That's because if it's in the heart of one generation, it's going to be in the hands of the next generation. And that we, we have the, this generation here, that if it's in our hearts, if it's clouded our heart, if it's clouded our minds, and if it's continuing living in here, we're at stake of passing it on to the children. We're at stake of passing on to the next generation, the third generation, the fourth generation. The Bible makes it so clear that, it's, that there's no such thing as secret sin. There's no such thing that, that, that sin that can be held secret, that everything will be brought to light. That, that if you think it's just living in here, you're going to pass it down. You think it's just living here, but it's going to be passed down to the next generation, to the third and fourth here. And don't let the enemy lie to you. Uh, oh, it, it's It's nothing. It's sin. We can hide it. We can hide it. We can just clear the browser. We can just, we can just, you know, not tell anyone. It won't hurt anyone. I can do it if it doesn't, if no one knows. But let me tell you, the Bible still says it's so perfect. Remember, remember that transgression is an outward. Iniquity is inward. Let me read this to you. Isaiah 53, 5 says, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that was brought, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Isn't that some good news today? That the transgressions and iniquities he hung on the cross for, for our transgressions, for our iniquity, he said, No, I'm gonna die on the cross for you. So I do have some good news here for you, because I know we went out of the gates pretty hard. But hey, I got some good news for you. That's what the cross was for. That's why Jesus died on the cross. It's for our transgressions. It's for iniquities that the punishment he endured was paid in full. Paid in full. Don't don't just skip it over, but impurities can affect your family. I hope that you you know what's at stake, that your next generation is at stake. And I want to give you the next uh, area that impurity affects us with. And so impurity will affect your faith. Impurity will affect your faith. It affects your walk with God, and it affects your walk with others. So let me explain it to you. So impurity and sexual sin specifically opens the door to other numerous sins in our lives. So I'm going to give you a couple. It opens the door to deception. It opens the door to manipulation. And it opens the door to lying. So when you, when you engage in this, in this sexual sin, you're, you're going to find yourself walking into dishonesty, and you're going to start deceiving others. You're going to start trying to deceive your family members. You're going to start, start uh, deceiving your friends, start deceiving other people, and you're going to live a life where you're going to start manipulating situations. You're going to find yourself manipulating, hiding, trying to go in the background, manipulate people's thoughts and actions, and then you're going to find yourself just lying, living a life that's, that's false, living a life that's full of lies and deception and manipulation. And you're going to have to sneak around. You're sneaking around being dishonest. And we talked about this last week and how David opened himself up to the door of this, uh, to become sexually immoral. Then he went on to commit murder to cover it up. You see, where David was supposed to be on the, on the battlefield, he was supposed to be with his soldiers fighting on the front lines, yet he was at home not living out the call God had for his life. 
and he found himself with an opportunity to become sexual and more, and he took it. And then it, is just, it didn't stop there. He actually went, went and had uh, the girl, the Bathsheba's wife or her husband killed in the front lines, and that was Uriah. Had him killed because David tried to, he tried to cover up his sin. And let me tell you right now that it's, it's not worth it. It's going to affect your faith. It's going to affect your walk with God because we're, we're going to try to lie and deceive, manipulate. So then you're going to find yourself coming to church with a calloused heart, a calloused soul, a calloused spirit. And we're going to raise our hands during worship. We're going to be praising God. We're going to raise our hands, but our hearts are covered and not be able to receive from Jesus, not be able to receive the revelation that God wants to give you this morning, not being able to receive the love and the forgiveness that God wants to pour out to you on your life because we're being deceptive with God. And we think we're being deceptive with God, and we eventually, if we go down this road, we eventually won't be convicted anymore. We'll live a life where we're just numb. Our emotions are numb, but we don't hear God as as we used to, we eventually don't be convicted of the things that used to convict us. And this is why James called this a wicked thing and a sin against God. In James chapter 1, verse 14 through 16 says this, says, but each, of, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and incited by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not, be de- do not be deceived, my, my beloved brethren. Do not be deceived. Do not bring forth death in your life. Because impurity, it affects our, your family. It, it impurity affects your faith. And number three, impurity affects your future. Impurity affects your future. See, the enemy was trying to prevent Joseph fulfilling his destiny here. And he's trying to, trying to throw some things at him. And he's throwing this purity test at Joseph. And he's throwing Potiphar's wife in front of him. And it's day after day, day after day, where she's presenting herself. She's like, Joseph, come and sleep with me. Come, Joseph, come and experience this pleasure with me. Joseph's saying no. He is passing his purity test. And he's saying no. You know why? Because he lived a life that was sanctified, set apart. In that moment, the enemy will try to try to throw some things at you that it will cause you to walk in impurity. But if you continue to walk down that road of impurity, you not fulfill the destiny God has called on your life. See, it is God's will that you are sanctified, and that's just really a fancy fancy word for for uh, meaning. Meaning basically is set apart. We're going to live a life that's set apart from the world. We're going to live a, li- a life that's set apart from from the world's culture and from the world's standards. See, 1 Thessalonians says this. It says, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your body in a way that is holy and honorable to God, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should, try to, should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. And there's something that we can easily skip over, but I want to I hone in on a little more. It says that each of you should learn to control your body. So that means we can learn this. That means there is good news. That if, if you've been in this cycle of like, man, I have been here. I've been failing the purity test. I've been walking sexually and more. I've been walking in that. And I don't know how. And the Bible says we can learn this. There is good news that we can learn how to live a life that's set apart. We can live a life that's holy, that's honorable to God. We can live this life. And each of us should learn to control our body that is holy and honorable. We can learn this. And I'm going to give you some parameters later here in, in this message. But before we do that, I want to uh, stay on this word of immorality. Because it's a very interesting word here. See, in Greek, it's, it's pronounced pornea. And, we get, and this is where we get the word pornography from. And so what, is, what does pornea mean? Pornea has this. Can refer, can refer to a wide range of things. It can refer to prostitution, sexual intercourse outside of marriage, pedophilia, homosexuality, incest, premarital sex. It has this wide range. It does, and I love that the Bible doesn't shy away from it. The Bible won't shy away from any topic that we go through. The Bible way doesn't shy away from any stage of life you find yourself in. The, the Word of God can speak to anything and, 
anyone at any time because it's alive and active. It's alive and active. It's, it's, it's as if God knew mankind would struggle with this. It's as if man, uh, God knew that, that the enemy will try to take this gift that God has given us and twist it and manipulate and deceive others and lie to mankind. It's as, it's as if God knew. It's as, it's, it's as if God knew. And God's here telling us in his love letter, this is how you fight it. This is something we can learn from. This is something that we can conquer together. This is something that you don't have to stay, stay in. We can conquer this together. You see, sex was supposed to be a gift. It was supposed to be a gift for mankind, but in the context of one man, one woman, and in marriage. That is the context of sex. That's what God intended sex for, but as mankind, we've bent that. We've bent that. We've idolized it. We've idolized sex and pleasure that, that we've idolized it so much. I'm going to share some staggering statistics soon, but we've idolized it so much and we shifted the blame to others so much that we don't take ownership here. And that if we were just, if we, if we were just the, if all the men could just keep it in their pants, we'd be so much better. If the men could just control their hormones, we'd be so much better. We'd be better off. Well, if the women didn't dress this way, we can be so much better off. Well, if the women didn't do this, well, if they didn't dress in public like that, if they didn't talk this way, live this way, we could be so much better. But we didn't. For a moment, we stopped taking ownership of it, and we didn't look inward at our own heart and how we're bent towards sinful and how we can fix the problem. Like, hey, what can I do, Lord, to fix this curse, to pass this purity test? If we just look on the inside and stop blaming others, there's going to be a change we can see in our legacy. There can be a change in our culture. There can be a change in our generation. There can be a change in our family, in our schools, in our workplace. If we look inward and say, I said enough is enough. And if we didn't blame left and right, oh, they didn't do this, they didn't do that. We're too busy blaming others, but we just took inward, we took ownership. We can see change together. We're now we're at a point in culture where it's really a snowball. It's snowballed really bad, and it's out of control. And I can, I'm going to give you a glimpse. There are some staggering t- statistics I want to share with you regarding sexual immorality and specifically uh, pornography. So number one I want to share with you today is porn is a global estimated 97 billion industry with about 12 billion of that coming from the U.S. 97 billion dollar industry. I was thinking of telling a joke, but I'm not. Number two, according to a recent Report by the BBFC, 75% of parents believe their child had never encountered porn. But but of those children, 53% reported that they had, in fact, seen porn. And that statistic alone fires me up because we know the enemies at work. We know the enemies after the next generation. Where, we, where he knows we can get them at a, such a young age, we can entice them with some strongholds and some bondage, and that fires me because we're at spiritual war. There's a legacy at stake for your life and for the next generation. And I hope you guys see that. And number three, according to data from the SEM Rush Traffic and Analytic Tools, as of May 2021, porn, site, porn sites received more, tra- more website traffic in the U.S. than Twitter, Instagram, Netflix, Pinterest, and Lincoln combined. That's a lot of traffic, guys. When you think about how big Twitter is, how big Instagram is, how big Netflix is, everyone has Netflix, everyone has Twitter, everyone has Instagram, everyone has a Pinterest, even I do. (laughs) And Lincoln combined. Porn gets more traffic. And all those combined. See, this is a sober reminder that the enemy is at work presenting this in such a way that is bringing people to a dark cycle, living in this impure lifestyle. And I love what 1 Corinthians says. It says this, flee from sexual immorality. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor, your, honor God with your body. Honor God with your body. 
you were bought at a price. And if you're in here today thinking you're not worthy to be loved and that you're not worth, worthy enough for God's love, this scripture says right here, you were bought at a price, that you are worth it, that you are loved, you are more than enough. I don't care what happened in high school, what they told you, what label they put on you. No, God says you are enough, and that's why I sent my son Jesus to die on the cross for you, because you are loved. You're worthy. You are more than worthy. So impurity affects, affects our family, and, and, and impurity will affect your faith, and impurity will affect your, number three, impurity will affect your future. Impurity will affect your future. I want to apologize for production, I did skip that, sorry. But impurity will uh, affect your future. And if we continue down this road, this third and fourth generation, we will see, we will see a, an endless cycle. And, we, and I want to put, put a little star next to your future, when it says your future. And I, wanna, I, want you to put, I want you to put your family as well. It affects your future, your family, the next generation. See, God created us with this desire, this desire, with passion, this desire, with this passion, with this fire burning inside of us to be fulfilled sexually. But write this down. It's so important. I want, you to, I want to explain it and help you become free today and fulfill your God-given destiny. And if we're ever going to pass the purity test, I want you to write this down. Passions need parameters. Passion needs parameters. See, when you think of a fire, a fire needs some parameters. You just don't go light a fire in the field, right? And then you have so many orchards around fire, but that's why we have fire pits. That's why we have fire places. See, there are parameters around this passion, around this fire that we need, that we need to understand. And Galatians 5.24 says, those who belong in Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. So what are the parameters you talk about, Robert? What are these parameters that you're talking about that I can leave with? And I'm going to give you four of them today. There are four things that are some param- that param- that parameters that you will need in your life to have this life of purity. And number one is make a commitment to God's standards. Make a commitment to God's standards. Make, make, make a commitment to God's word. See, God will say things that will conflict and contradict with the world's culture. It's going gonna, it's gonna to conflict and contradict what the world is saying to do. It's going to always conflict what the world is going to say to you. So you have to make a commitment that I'm going to live God's standard. I want to challenge you. Make a commitment for one year in your life that said, whatever the Bible says, I'm going to make a commitment to his standard, to the God standard. And say, I'm going to go all in. I'm not going to be on the fence of, of, trying, of trying to live one foot, one foot out, one foot in, one foot out. But no, I'm going to go all in on God's standards. And say, so I'm going to believe what God says. I'm going to believe his word. Anything from Genesis to Revelation, I'm going to believe that. I'm going to make a commitment to live God's standards. And you may be thinking, okay, that's one good, one good point, but how, how do I live pure? How do, take me on this journey, Robert. How do I, what, what do I do next? And I love what Psalms 139, it answers that question. It says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word according to Scripture, according to God's Word. But to live according to His Word, you have to know the Word. You have to know the, not only know the Word, but know the author of the Bible. Get to know God. Get to know Jesus in an intimate way as, as a Heavenly Father, as a Father that listens, as a, as a Father that is there. Because there's going to be a time in your life when you're going to be tempted, and you're going to, and you're going to have to stand your ground and say, enough is enough. You're going to say, enough is enough. You're going to have to say, devil, you can't have my family no more. You're going to have to say, enough is enough. You've had your way too much. You've had, you've had your way generation upon generation upon generation, and this needs to be a generation that says enough, that the, it stops with you. It stops here, this generational curse. It stops here, and you're going to choose to live by the word of God, and you're going to say, hey, I'm going to wake up every morning and say, Lord, what do you have to speak to me? What do you want to speak to me? What do, what do you want to reveal to me? And I'm going to live it, and I'm going to believe it because it stops here. 
because it's far too, we've, we've read these statistics, we've seen here with other families, we've seen with other friends that the, that the, that the devil has them in this, in this cycle, and we're going to say, no, not my family. Not my family. I want to speak to the men in here as the leaders of the household, the spiritual leaders of the household. You, for you and your household, would you say that we will serve the Lord? What would you step up and say, as for me and my household, we are going to church. We are reading our Bibles. We are going to have devotional life. We are going to serve together. We are going to do this because we're going to see a generational change. Are we going to live that way? We're going to say enough is enough, and we're going to commit to God's standards and the second parameter we need in our lives is we need to manage my mind. Manage our mind. Manage our mind. All sexual impurity begins in the mind. It begins up here, guys. It begins as a thought. It begins here in the mind, and it continues with the eyes and the ears. So it begins with a thought, and then the thought will consume, will consume your mind if you don't bring it under submission. And then it, it brings forth action. It brings forth action because I know more times than not, you just didn't fall into sin. We just don't fall into sin. Oh, I accidentally had premarital sex. That just doesn't happen. But no, there was, there was a time in our lives where you, you thought about it and you let it consume your mind and, you, and looked lustfully over the man or woman for a while. And you let it, you let it live here. You let it consume your mind. You, you, you weren't guarding your eyes. You weren't guarding your ears. And, and you drifted away from God's heart and God's, sta- God's standard of living. Oh, you drift away from his protection. And you fall into that transgression, that outward sin, that outward action. I love what Job 31 says. He says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully on a girl. Have you made a covenant with your eyes lately? You made a covenant, like, I'm going to put a filter over these eyes. I'm going to put a filter over here. I'm going to put a filter of what I see. Because what you feed yourself is really going to come from, from your mind. It's going to come down to here and start living in your heart. And it's going to bring forth action. Psalms 101 verse 3 says, I will set before my eyes no vile thing. No vile thing. No vile thing. I want to encourage you, be proactive, not reactive. Like, what are you doing before you even reach the temptation point. What are you doing? How disciplined is your Bible reading? How disciplined is your relationship with Jesus and God? Is it an intimate relationship where, where you even think about sinning or you even think about that? You're like, no, I can't. I'm not going to grieve God. I'm not going to hurt my heavenly father. I'm not going to go down that path. Do you have guardrails set up in your life? Do you have accountability partners where they can ask you anything? They can look at your internet browser. They can look at your Instagram DMs, Twitter DMs. Uh, Pinterest is a thing. Can they look at all of that? And do you have these guardrails up? And not only that, and how is the support level with your friends? How is that support level? Because in life, we, we're, we all go through, there are stressors in our life. There is stress in our lives. And, and as our stress builds up, there's going to need to be a support level that comes up with it. And if there's a gap between your support level and the stress level, see that gap right there? That gap right there is where we're going to fall into what we find more, more pleasurable, and that's when you're going to fall into sin. So who is around your life that can help you bump that support level up? Who around you can support you and can, be, can love you in an authentic and loving way? Who is your accountability friend? Where are the guardrails at, and do you have a filter over your eyes? See, if we're ever going to beat the impurities here, we need, we need to, one, make a commitment to God's standard, Manage our minds. And number three, write this down. Magnify the consequences. Magnify the consequences. Proverbs 6.32 says, But a man who commits adultery lacks judgment. Whoever does so destroys himself. The man who commits adultery lacks judgment. Magnify the consequences, guys. Magnify the cost of sin. Magnify what would happen if you were to walk down that path. Magnify, what would, what would your spouse think if you were to walk down this path? What would your, your loved one think? How would that trust be broken? Think about what the cause of pain that you, you, would, be in, you would be inflicting if we didn't magnify the consequences. Even if, even if you think it's small, because that's what the enemy likes to do. It's like, no, it's just a small sin. No, I want you to blow it up. I want you to magnify. You're like, no, I'm not going to hurt my spouse. No, I could 
I can lose my friends. No, I could lose my trusted, trusted ones. I could lose the trust of my kids. Magnify the consequences and what you'll realize is it's not worth it. What you'll realize is that living God's standards a lot better than what the world is trying to project onto us. A whole lot better with that. A whole lot better. And, and I love how Joseph, Joseph even practiced these. As, as Potiphar's wife would come day after day, he would, he would say, no. No, your husband is trusting me with much. No, I'm going to magnify this consequence. What would he think? No, he's entrusting me with this whole thing. No one, he's second in power here. No, I'm not going to do this. God has given you a family. God has given you something to store in your life. And are you going to magnify the consequences and realize how precious that is? And how that he's entrusted you with that. Are you going to magnify the way Joseph did? Are you going to do that? Are you going to, are you going to make a commitment to live God's standard the way Joseph lived in God's standard? Are you going to, Manage your mind and magnify the consequences. And number four, write this down. Maintain proper relationships. Maintain proper relationships. If we're going to beat this, guys, if we're going to pass this purity test, we need to maintain proper relationships. And we're going to start off with, with your spouse. How is that relationship with your spouse? Do you need to add some more wood to that fire? Do you, do you need to go on a date night? Do you need to wash those dishes that have been piling up and you're kind of just waiting for her to wash or for him to wash them? But it doesn't just stop there. Who is around you? Who are those brothers and sisters around you, the good friends? Do you have those proper relationships that, they can, that you can call on, that you can lean on for a bit? What small group are you in? When life comes at you, when these impurity tests comes at you, who do you have in your life that you can call on and say, hey, I, I need some help. I need some help. And you can call on those trust, trusted friends. Proverbs 13, 20 says, he who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. Who are you walking with today, church? Who are you walking with that can help you with this purity test? I can help you. See, what if, what if we just, instead of, instead of trying to change the facts of our lives, we just change the acts of our lives, of our lives. What if we quit living a life of deception and manipulation and lying? What would our life look like? What if we just opened up and became vulnerable? To others? What if, what if you identify the hurt from your childhood that's carried on to adulthood? What if you have identified that and maybe that was the reason why you kept falling into this impure relationships, impure circumstances? What if there was just some wounds in your childhood that we just never addressed? What if we were just honest? What if, what if you were you're honest and say, I was just mad at God because my father walked out and he never showed me love. I never experienced a, a heavenly or an earthly fatherly love, and now it's hard to even trust a heavenly God. What, what, if, what if we were just honest for just a little bit? What if we just admitted that there was some emotional neglect when you were little? And you never got the proper love from your parents. You never got the proper care from your parents. And it's carried over today. And you've been trying to find love. You've been trying to find answers and, and people's love. And, and it's just not working. My last rhetorical question here is, what if we answered one of these main questions here? What if you stopped and answer this question in here because it's a question that we've all want to know subconsciously it's these three questions here it's am I safe am I loved am I wanted that's the core questions every human's asking subconsciously am I am I safe am I loved am I wanted and if any of those weren't answered in your childhood you 
Chances are you grew up and carry those over without even knowing. And, you, and we see the fruit of it of living an impure lifestyle, trying to go relationship to relationship, pleasure moment after pleasure moment. And there are three responses in here and you might find yourself in. You can find yourself in defensiveness. You can find yourself in remorse. Or you can find yourself in repentance. Maybe you are defensive. Maybe this wall just shot up when we said we're going to talk about purity. Maybe it's just our hearts are callous. Maybe there's remorse and you're feeling shame and guilt about your, your lifestyle and your past. Maybe you're here and you're, you're, you're like, I'm, I'm repenting. I'm going to change my way of living. And if you are feeling shame and guilt, just know that's not from God. That's not from Jesus. That's where the enemy wants you. He wants to shame you and guilt you. But what Jesus does, he brings that, he brings a sense of light and says, let's work on this together. You're going to find my grace. You're going to find my mercy no matter where you are no matter where you make your bed, no matter where you can try to run, you can try to hide, but my grace and mercy is going to follow. 2 Corinthians says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.